Hello again. Squadron Sergeant Major Nigel Worthington, SAS, or Nige to you and me, arrived on the scene in Louisville at the military checkpoint three days after the beginning of the Knox event. Ostensibly, he's here to support the American military in their efforts to contain the event and keep it from spilling out any further than it already has. But that's gone to shit. It's out and everyone knows it. Nige isn't here because he's a hero. He's here because his wife lives in Rosewood. Why does an SAS man's wife live in Kentucky? Oi, quiet you. I'm building a narrative here. His position fell apart and his squad were overrun the moment they disembarked the Chinook. Nige muttered something under his breath about improvising, adapting and overcoming, and it gave him the required mental fortitude to hide in a portaloo listening to his entire squad being devoured mere meters away. Bloody hell, Sergeant Major. There are the barriers. Sergeant Major? Nice. <laughs> After regaining his extremely masculine composure, Nige sets out on his journey. By his reckoning, he's got at best one day to beat the hordes to Rosewood and save his beloved, who's named Marjorie for some reason. I don't know, spiteful parents or something. Luckily for Nige, this one day is no ordinary one day in Project Zomboid. If you've played Project Zomboid before, then you'll probably know that a day lasts one real life hour. But if you're really feeling it, you can set that timescale to real time. Anyway, whilst I explained that, Nige rummaged through the Americans' military tents for some knives and MREs to sustain him on his journey across Kentucky. Leaving through the checkpoint isn't an option, so instead we're searching the perimeter fence for a gap. There must be one, since that's how the checkpoint was overrun. And here we are. A short run through the woods from here takes us to this rail yard where we'll check some cars just in case something's running. That'd save a whole lot of time and energy. But Nige has no such luck. Whilst there though, he takes on some of the local shamblers with his knife. On one such occasion, whilst attempting to push a zombie over, his hand slips over their rancid melting face and picks up a scratch in the scuffle. His hat fell off too. It's a top priority for Nige that it stays on so as to hide his absolutely hideous flat top haircut. So after dealing with the problematic shuffler, very slowly, thanks to his now injured hand, he pops his boonie back on, keeps calm, and carries on. He's repeatedly muttering something under his breath about Queen and Country, stiff up a lip, laddie, because he's a northern man and it's the early 90s. As far as I'm aware, that's all they did back then. Anyway, Nige and his stiff upper lip calmly carry on looting the rail yard. Not really sure what he's looking for, so after a little while, it's onwards for a long walk along the train tracks south towards the river. He kills some more along his journey, and before long he arrives at this warehouse, which provides a good opportunity to fill his water bottle and clean off a bit. You've got to stay clean for Marjorie. Wouldn't want to show up looking like one of the dead now, would we? In the locker room, Nige finds the all-important bum bag, in which to store cigarettes and medical supplies in a perfect juxtaposition of convenience. You might have noticed that Nige, despite being SAS, doesn't have a firearm. Naturally, he lost it in his desperate evasion of the hordes back at the checkpoint, so as a result we're keeping an eye out for anything of that nature amongst the dead. Like this officer of the undead PD here with his shotgun. As much as I'd love to liberate it from them, there's simply too many dead here to get it done. After a couple of tries to single the officer out, Nige moves on and continues his long run. Which leads him to this small cluster of houses, where he'll take on some calories, an army marches on its stomach and all that, a lovely meal and lettuce and hot dog, therefore, should do the trick. You might also notice that we've made it this far in less than one in-game hour. It's pretty strange to have come so far from the starting point and still be in daylight and not be tired at all. After brunch, which I guess is what that was, we come across a police car and its former inhabitants, from whom we can finally procure some firearms. Nige spent basically all of his character creation points on gun skills, so he really needs some. In the boot of the car we find a JS-2000 shotgun. One of the officers has a revolver, and in the glove box is an M9 pistol. All very nice. Except for the fact that Nige decided to break the car's window with his fucking elbow instead of the multitude of window-breaking objects he's carrying, like some kind of wannabe Terminator. So after clawing the broken glass out of his arm with his bare hands and patching up the wound, we can, uh, get out of here. 
but we got a decent amount of 9mm ammo, so I figured it was worth finding out how viable a weapon it is. Uh, not very. Oh well, onwards. A little ways down the road, we find more police vehicles in a blockade this time. Contained within are more boxes of 9mm ammo and a box of shotgun shells. So let's get a feel for the shotgun. Yep, that one works. Just need way more shells and then we're good, but we can figure that out later. Right now, we're continuing our marathon along the highway- Ha 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 fuck! Uh, sprinted into a zombie and got lacerated. This isn't going well. We're probably infected by this point. At least we have a long time before symptoms show up though, given the game's time scale. I suppose it's all the more motivation to get our dopey ass across the map to dearest Marjorie as soon as possible. Just as soon as the hat is back on, really can't be walking around with that god awful flat top out, zombie apocalypse or not. So Nige is a little bit beat up, but it's nobody's fault but his. What do you mean it's my fault? No, this is Nigel's story. It's got nothing to do with me. Whilst we are talking about me though, subscribe to the channel if you enjoy my content. If you really enjoy my content, consider becoming a channel member or checking out my Patreon. Sorry for the plug, but I've been avoiding sponsors lately because they can be a bit of a pain to deal with, so I should probably take the time to plug my own stuff once in a while here. Anyway, back to it. Nige is arriving in West Point now, and this truck has caught his eye. Ah, fuck! Alright, that's enough. We don't have many shells, but we're using some to thin this herd, because that wasn't very nice. I was looking at the cool American-style truck. We have snub-nosed ugly things across the pond, so these things look amazing by comparison to us Brits. Alright, that'll do. Let's jump into a house and heat up a chicken stroganoff MRE to calm down, eh? Despite all the, uh, extremely close contact with the undead, we're not showing any signs of infection just yet. But then again, it's only been a few hours. It feels like it's been days. My zomboid body clock is all out of whack. Oh well, no time to hang around and think about it. Next stop is Muldraw, which is a fairly substantial run south from here. Along the way is this service stop with a clothes store. Best rip up some for rags, since it seems like we're going to need more bandages sooner than later at the rate we're going through them. The only thing we're really interested in in Muldraw is the police station. If we can find a sledgehammer, then we ought to be able to stock up on shotgun shells there. The first place I figure is worth checking is the warehouse on the north side of town, which is where I'll be coming in anyway. And believe it or not, the third or fourth crate I checked had a sledgehammer in it. Okay, fair enough, I'll take it. So, all the way across town on the south is the police station, which has quite a crowd gathered around it. That'll take quite some stabby pokey to deal with, but then we can bust in through the back door and head straight for the storeroom and its spoils. Its spoils on this occasion are four boxes of shotgun shells and quite a bit of 9mm. This playthrough is using vanilla guns, so there's not a million different things to find in places like this. But that's fine, this will do. Off we go now, putting down the remaining undead officers outside on the way. And hey, this one has a key for a Cadillac gauge. What's that, some kind of pimp wagon? Oh. Oh my. It's in good nick, just needs some fuel. The power is still on and there's a gas station up the road, so I just need a fuel can. And after rummaging through half of Muldrow's car boots, we got one. The gas station though is predictably rather crowded, so we're in for another long round of stabby pokey before we can fill this can up. But once we finally do, it's back to the APC. We can fill it from the can and then drive back to Foss Oil again because a little 5 litre can isn't going to do it. Now this thing isn't exactly quiet either, so by the time we make it there we've got quite a lot of new friends. Let's introduce them to my good friend, the Reverse Donut. Alright, that should give us some time to work, let's brim the tank. As you might imagine, driving over about 200 people and their roughly 40,000 bones did some damage to the tyres, but aside from that the gauge is unharmed. It's a very sturdy beast. Fourth, to Rosewood. Nige is coming to save you, Margie. Oops, missed the turn. Here we are. The house is barricaded, that's a good sign. Looks like a few got in in the back, but neither of them are Marge. Oh no. 
That's her, with her hideous flat top, and two other men in the bedroom. I can't believe you've done this, Marge. The sight of his beloved undead Marge getting apocalypse double teamed caused something in Nigel's mind to snap. And then, a minute later, stamping in her brittle face snapped a few other bits. Now is probably a good time to go on a rampage. That's all the shotgun shells, it's time for the M9. In case you ever find yourself stuck using a 9mm against a horde in Zomboid, I find an ideal tactic is to draw them over fences and shoot them while they're down. But despite having almost 300 rounds, the horde never really seemed to thin. There's only a few bullets left, there's just one thing to do. That wasn't supposed to happen. Well, shit. What now? I, I guess we just survive. It's only 2.30 after all. I suppose we'd best pick a house in Rosewood and set up shop for a while. This one ought to do. It's been barricaded before and it'll be barricaded again. Just got to chuck out any skanks left inside and we should be able to set the place up nicely. It's missing a door though and Nige doesn't know how to make one. We'll crack into an MRE on the porch in front of the corpse pile. Hmm. No hiss. No disappointed, but the drink mix is a winner. Now to go looking for carpentry books, and other generally useful items. Down at the end of the street we find volumes 1 and 2, which are very nice, but upon getting them home I learned that reading takes a very, very long time. Likely longer than just grinding out carpentry without the books. Instead of just grinding out carpentry though, Let's set fire to some bodies. There's a bottle of booze in the bathroom cabinet to make a Molotov with. Chuck it over there and... Uh, that was a little unexpected. Okay, patch up the burn on our shin and see how bad this gets. Okay, well, the, the house didn't burn down. I guess we might as well use some of this glass on the floor to train first aid a little. Even just a couple of levels makes for faster healing and better use of your tended limbs. Or something like that, I'm not sure of any exact numbers, to be honest. As I'm sure many of you know, you do this by just standing in glass and picking the pieces out of one foot at a time. Even without reading, you'll very quickly get a few levels up, which you'll notice allows me to bandage up my now lacerated feet and walk relatively quickly. I probably shouldn't have done that though, because now I can't run. So I guess we're reading after all. The survival show will come on in a little bit, so we'll sit here and wait for it. Maybe it'll tell us how to survive zombification. Nope, just fishing. Let's go upstairs and sit on the bed. We're not tired enough to sleep, so just have to sit here and question the meaning of life, reality, and time itself. What is time? Oh, hey look, there's some sleeping tablets in the bedside drawers. Let's bash a few of those down and get to bed. Oh god, even sleeping is intolerably slow. This is at the maximum speed. A couple of in-game hours later though, Nige wakes up. I think from a combination of not being that sleepy yet and being in complete agony. Something's killing him. Pretty quickly too. Ah oh, right, there's still glass in his feet. Let's just whip that out and now he's regaining health. Or is he? His health bar is kind of fighting itself. Dropping down a little and then slowly regenerating again. SSM Worthington, are you dying or not? Decide! Oh, yes, you are. Alright, well, we're not going out slowly. The house was full of weapons, so let's go and kill some... Oh. 
He's already dead. Uh, that was underwhelming. Squad Sergeant Major Nigel Worthington was by far my least competent Project Zomboid character to date, and yet still somehow accomplished everything he intended to. I suppose that's just how things go. Fail upwards, as they say. He survived 20 hours and killed about 700 zombies in that time, which is a pretty impressive rate, but most of those were from the comfort of the driver's seat of an APC. In any case, remain indoors. It's really not worth going out and getting involved in all this kind of thing. You'll only end up like Nige. Heartbroken and then dead. Thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>